the doctrine of the church. Um, we're talking about this today, next week. And oh, but I need to start out by saying I knew there's some I was forgetting. Um, the, what you need to know about this class, those who are close to being finished for all three of the classes, they should be available by the end of the weekend. You can either go on the website uh, late Sunday, early Monday, and, and pull them down, or if you can't access them on the website, then send me an email and I will um, respond back to you with them as a copy. Okay, so uh, in other words, I'll attach them and send them to you. So let me know about that. I'm sorry you don't have them done yet. I uh, just didn't get them finished. So today, the doctrine of the church. Next week, we're going to talk about the doctrine of the sacraments and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, the doctrine of the sacraments, ideally, should be part of the doctrine of the church. But I felt like I wanted to break it off because it's kind of a distinct uni uh, unit, and uh, I was concerned that we wouldn't have enough time to do it justice today. So next week, we're going to deal with the sacraments, although I want you to recognize going in that the sacraments are really an aspect of the doctrine of the church. Okay. We'll talk about that. And then, June 6th, the doctrine of the future. Where Where is this all going, according to our Christian theology? And then the final exam. Okay? Any questions about any of that? You all have been very patient all term in, in terms of being jerked around with the timing, and I appreciate it. So let's talk about the doctrine of the church, which is also, to use the theological word, ecclesiology. Okay? Ecclesiology deals with the origins of the Christian church, its relationship to Jesus, its role in salvation, its polity, destiny, and leadership. In other words, pretty much anything having to do with the nature, function, and direction of the church falls under ecclesiology. Um, it comes from two Greek words, ecclesia, which means the gathering or the, com the congregation, and logia, uh, which means the words or the knowledge. It's, you know, that's, every ology has that as part of it, which means the words that are made up, that make it up, because logos means word, or the study of, or the knowledge of, the discipline of. Um, so this, interestingly enough, ecclesiology, the word started being used fairly recently, like the 19th century, and originally, for about the first 100 years or so, um, Ecclesiology did not mean the study of the theology of the church, like what we're talking about. Instead, ecclesiology meant the study of the building of churches. It was primarily architecture. In fact, the word, the, there's a claim made by an architectural magazine in Great Britain, that I think still exists, that they invented the word. They took the Greek words and put them together to talk about the study of church architecture. I mean, obviously you know that church architecture has been uh, one of the great achievements of humanity is the ability to build places of worship. In fact, my two favorite buildings in the whole world, because we haven't finished our church yet, <laughs> my two favorite buildings in the whole world are the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which was built in the 500s, this extraordinary church that spent a period of time then as a Muslim mosque after the, uh, the uh, Turks, Seljuk Turks took over. And then from the 1920s till now has been a museum. That's because Ataturk, the, the guy who brought the, the Turkish people into the 21st, 20th century, the 21st century, although they're still here, um, <laughs> he changed everything. He changed their language, he changed their alphabet, he changed their mode of dress, and one of the things he did is he brought them into the Western world. You know, he, he sort of made them available to the Western society, and one of the things I think he realized he had to do is since most of the people in the Western world that he wanted to be able to trade with and communicate with and relate to were Christian, or at least significantly Christian. Having the most historic and ancient of Christian churches being used as a Muslim mosque did not sound very good, so he had to turn it into a museum. He couldn't go back and have a training with church again, so it's now a museum. Um, but this idea, oh, and my second favorite building in the whole world <laughs> is the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, which is Gaudi's church. If you've never been there, it is astonishing. And I think 2020 is the completion date now, or is it 2024? They've been working on it for 100 years. Yeah. And um, Gaudi, when he was still, and they're still working from Gaudi's plans. He did all these plans and drawings and everything else, and they're still working from that. But when somebody wants to ask him after they've been going for 20 years or so, how long is this going to take? He smiled and said, uh, my employer is not in a hurry. <laughs> Meaning God. Okay. So anyway. 
We have some builders like that at Munster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so as well. Um, so it did mean for a period of time that, that church architecture, but it has regained what I think is the appropriate meaning, and that is the study, the theological study of the nature of the church and how it functions. Now, we get our word church as well as various other translations. You know, Kirk, K-I-R-K, is the Scottish word for church. And since some of us are Presbyterians, you know, we come out of Scottish Presbyterianism. Kirk with an E is the Dutch word for church. And Kirka is the German word for church. All of those come from the same root, which is the Greek word kuriake, which means belonging to the Lord. So our word church, while ecclesia in the Greek usually gets translated as church in the New Testament, that's not actually the root of our word church. Uh, our word is kuriaka, okay? Belonging to the Lord. So, um, there are a number of issues that ecclesiology deals with, to be a little more specific. First, who or what is the church? What constitutes the church? Is the church of what hap what's happening now, as Flip Wilson, you know, remember Flip Wilson? <laughs> the Flip Wilson show, you know, he's in the church of what's happening now. Is that part of the church? Are the Jehovah's Witnesses part of the church? You know, what do we mean by church? Secondly, what is the relationship of the individual believer to the church? And you will notice that I use a capital C when I write church in this context, because I am talking about the whole church, not a church building or even an individual church. If I'm talking about Lakeside Presbyterian Church, I'll use a small c because this is one manifestation, if you will, of the larger church. And we're going to talk about that. You know, the universal church versus the local church, as well as the visible church versus the invisible church. I'm probably going to talk about that more than anything else. So what's the relationship of the individual believer to the large, you know, the large context of the church, the universal church? What does the church do? Or what is it supposed to do? What is the authority of the church? You know, what power do we have? And how, how, what, what's the church supposed to be doing? How, how should the church be governed? What's the structure of authority? How is that practiced? Would you guys stop primping back there in the back row? <laughs> um, how does the church's new covenant, which Jesus instituted as the church developed and began, we'll talk about the day of Pentecost, how does that relate to the covenants that God created between himself and the people of Israel, as expressed in Scripture? And particularly is related to the call of Abram, before he even became Abraham. What is the relationship there? Um, some, some will say that the church started on the day of Pentecost. Some say it started the day God called Abram. Which is it? And then what is the ultimate <laughs> destiny of the church? Where is the church headed? Not just in terms of in this life, but ultimately at the, the final day. Um, what, you know, what's happening with the church in the future? Those are just some of the questions. And I'm going to hit on some of those today. I may not get into all of that, but we'll talk about some of those things. The church is very, very important. Sometimes we think, okay, it's all about Jesus, without remembering that the church is the body of Christ. It is anointed, ordained, called forth by Jesus himself. And so for those reasons, if none other, the church has to be important in our understanding. It is not to be taken lightly. Some, you know, I had a, a dear friend of mine, you know, committed, believing brother, who once said, you know, I love the Lord, and I'm committed to Him, but I don't care if I ever am involved in the church again or not. It's just so messed up. My, and I said, well, that's an awfully selfish attitude. If you don't think that the church as it exists now is what it should be, then maybe God is telling you, you need to go out and make it better. It's not just there to serve you. The church is bigger than that. It's more important than that. Okay? So these are just some of the things that the study of church, the doctrine of church ecclesiology gets into. Now, I want to talk a little bit now about who or what is the church. And a lot of what I'm going to say today has to do with the, the, there are radically different conceptions of what the church is between Protestantism and Catholicism, with Eastern Orthodoxy floating somewhere in the middle. Okay. But the primary differences, which we need to understand, is the doctrinal differences between the perception the Roman Catholic Church has about the church and the Protestant uh, system of beliefs, all of them together, 
have about the church. Now, one way to think about the church is the church that is invisible, which means the global community of all of those who have, by faith, have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This global community, conspiracy, whatever you want to call it, of all those who have said, yes, I believe Jesus was the Son of God, and that he died to save me from my sins, I accept his salvation and I accept his lordship in my life. Anyone that says that is part of the invisible church, is the idea, or the communio fidelum, which is the community of faith. Um, we, I always get the questions, at the end, toward the end I'm going to talk about the four attributes or marks of the church that we talk about in our creeds. You know, that the church, um, and one, of, one of those four is the church that is Catholic. You will notice in the creeds that Catholic is not capitalized. That does not mean Roman Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. And that's why we still say that. Now, those words were used back before there was a Catholic versus Protestant thing. Because the Nicene Creed comes in the 300s. The Apostles' Creed comes even earlier than that. But the idea that there is a, a link between all of those who are believers in Jesus Christ around the world. Now... The oh, okay, I'll, I'll continue from there. Richard Baxter, a 17th century uh, Puritan theologian, says this. This is his definition of what the church is. These papers apart, which I think is beautiful, <laughs> brilliant, and it reflects the focus on the invisible church. The Christian church, Baxter writes, is the fellowship of all those who, in response to the apostolic message proclaimed in the Word, that's the Bible and sacraments confess their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a faith that is the gift of God's electing grace, he was a Puritan Calvinist, um, and, that works, uh, and that works by love, this love transcending the barriers of class, race, sex, culture, and nation, so that the church may be likened to the one body having many members under Christ who is the head. Okay, it was in the 17th century. But this is a beautiful description of what we mean by the invisible church, the universal or Catholic church, not Roman Catholic. In fact, this is not the way the Catholic Roman Catholic Church defines the church. The Roman Catholic Church has a very different understanding. In fact, their, the focus of the Roman Catholic Church is on what theologians would call the visible church. That is the external hierarchy, structure, activities, and even the architecture, the places of worship, both locally and globally, that can be seen by all. The Catholic Church emphasizes the structure, the hierarchy. They talk about the magisterium, which is the structure of authority that exists through the history of the Catholic Church. Um, Instead of the communio fidelum, which is the community of faith, they talk about the mater fidelium, which is the mother faith, or the mother church, you might hear. The Catholic Church believes that they, that, that institution and everything that represents it, the hierarchy, even the places of worship, all of the visible parts of it, is what the real church is. Um, all the way back to Origen, before there was a Roman Catholic versus Protestant. Origen said, uh, you cannot have, father, uh, have God as your father if you do not have the church as your mother. Mother. Okay. And in that regard, he was in effect, even though he was prior to the split, he was talking about the manifestation of the church in a very real structure and authority and presence in the world today. Not this invisible connection. Okay? Now... I want to talk about that for a few minutes because this is critically important when we talk about our understanding of what the church really is. Can you see okay? Am I hearing anything? No. Okay. Um, in Catholic theology, this idea of the visible church takes precedence over everything else. Precedence meaning it comes first. When I, I say that because the Catholic church in a Catholic systematic theology would we'll talk about the doctrine of the church before... They talk about anything like the doctrine of God or divine revelation or the doctrine of Scripture. Why? Because they say all of those things are only available and known through the church. Whereas the Protestant belief, and the belief sort of in the, the invisible church, is that we are in Christ and that causes us to be part of the church, the Roman Catholic theology would say the existence of the church is the only thing that makes 
even access to Christ available to you. We've talked about before, the Catholic Church believes that grace is not something that is freely available that anybody can access simply by faith, but rather that grace is a is con literally owned by, controlled by the Catholic Church, and that you receive grace from the Church as you take the sacraments. Salvation in the traditional Catholic view, and there are some priests, even priests, who don't agree with this, and certainly not a lot of individual uh, members of the Catholic Church, but the, the formal doctrine of the Catholic Church says you cannot be saved apart from membership and participation, especially receiving of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? So, they would say that the existence of the church takes precedence over any other theological discussion, because only the existence of the church, and they mean the visible church, the hierarchy, structure, etc., only through the visible church can you receive any of the rest of that stuff. They would say the Bible was written by the apostles, who were the foundation on which the church was built, especially Peter. Okay, you see that difference? Now let me give you a couple of definitions that come out of Catholic doctrines, or Catholic documents rather. Um, the first one is, and I'm quoting Burkauer here, and I actually couldn't figure out, or Burkoff, not Burkauer, I keep saying that, Burkoff. He quotes this, but I couldn't figure out where the quote came from, but it is, it's consistent with everything else I've read, so I believe it's true. The Catholic definition of the church is the congregation of all the faithful who, being baptized, notice the sacrament thing, profess the same faith, partake in the same sacraments, notice the sacraments thing, and are governed by their lawful pastors at, um, as one visible head on earth. Okay? Which the visible head on earth means the Pope, who is the authority over all the other pastors. The pastors being the priests. Another definition linked to that. Each element in this definition is meant to exclude apostates and heretics who do not profess the same Christian faith, non-Christians who do not receive the same sacraments, there's the sacrament emphasis, and schismatics who are not submissive to the church's lawful pastors under the Bishop of Rome. The church is defined as the Pope, those who are under the authority of the Pope as ministers, and those in the congregations who are under the authority of those priests. That's the definition of the church in the Catholic sense. Now, in fact, again, if you get into Catholic theology, the Catholic Church talks about um, two aspects of the church. I'm having trouble with this paper up here. It's sticking together. Um, get flamboyant for the camera. Right. It's right here. Um, historically, and his, because it's historical, you use Latin, there are two parts to the visible church in the Catholic doctrine. The first one is the ecclesia docens. You know the word docent? A docent is a guy, a leader. So, same root, ecclesia docens. The uh, ecclesia docens is the church as understood as existing in those who rule, teach, or edify. In other words, the Catholic, the Catholic magisterium, the Pope, the bishops, the priests okay, of the Catholic Church. The second aspect of the Church in Catholic theology is the Ecclesia Audiens. Ecclesia Audiens, and uh, Audiens is the same root as our audio, which means the ones who hear, the ones who listen. The Ecclesia Audiens are those who are taught, governed, or receive the sacraments. In other words, one part of the church, the Ecclesia Docents, are the leaders, the ones in charge. The other part of the church is the Ecclesia Audiens, who are the ones who are the lay people in the congregation who are being led and taught. Now, the significant part of that is the Catholic doctrine is that the Ecclesia Docents, the leaders, are the real church. They are the true church. They are the ones who participate directly in the glory of being the body of Christ. The lay people, the Ecclesia Audiens, according to traditional Catholic doctrine, which is still in place today, although some people would disagree with it, the Ecclesia Audiens, the lay people, are simply along for the ride. They benefit indirectly by the fact that the people in authority in the magisterium are part of the true church. 
the ecclesia docent, or perhaps you could say a true church so much as the, the part of the church that has direct access to the blessings of God. This is why, for instance, that, that historically Catholic priests participated in both elements in the sacrament, whereas the lay people were only given the bread. They were not given the wine. It's the issue of, take, of partaking in the sacrament of communion in both kinds, it's called, both the bread and the wine, was a huge issue in the Reformation. One of the reasons that's true is that, that priests took both kinds, but the lay were only given one kind, is the lay were seen as sort of being along for the ride. It was the true church were the leaders. Now, you probably never heard that before. But that is Catholic doctrine. And again, it goes back to this idea that the Catholic Church sees the visible manifestation of the Catholic Church as being the true church. And I'm not trying to pick on them. All of a sudden, it sounds so negative in my mind. But in order to understand what we believe about the church, we need to understand that that you know, the Catholic Church has a very different idea about it. Becky? Um, I was reading this week a little bit about it. it was it called the Ecclesia Ecclesiastic Council? Ecclesiastic Council? Well, there are, there are a number of ecclesiastical councils. And they said it's like members from all the, uh, the churches from all over the mm -hmm. world that would come in? The first one was the Council of Nicaea. There have been seven ecumenical Ecumen church councils. Ecumenical. Okay. Yeah, there have been seven of those. Um, the original seven that exist that happened, well, there's more than seven, but there are seven that everybody accepts because they happened before the split between Catholicism and, uh, and Protestantism. There were church councils, like the Council of Trent happened in the late 1500s, and it was in direct opposition to the Protestant Reformation. And so obviously the Protestant churches don't accept that as an ecumenical council because everything they, that's where they came out with all the stuff against Protestants, the schismatics that are in rebellion uh, kind of thing. But, yeah, so the ecumenical council, starting with the Council of Nicaea in the 300s, there have been a number of those. Uh, Nicaea, Constantinople, uh, Ephesus, etc. You know, so. and, and the one that was in, was it the 1950s or the 1950s? Yeah, 1960? uh, 1960s, are you thinking the Second Vatican Council? Hmm, I thought they called it an ecumenical council, and the, most of the priests and the higher up, um, the, most of the priests was against it. I think it was Pope John. John the 23rd. It's yeah. the Second Vatican that's Council. That's always. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Yep, that's it. Now it's not ecumenical because it didn't involve any Protestants. Now, if, if, if now to a Catholic that would have been ecumenical. Why? Because as far as they're concerned, the Catholics are the only ones who really are part of the Church, and so ecumenical would have meant they brought Catholics from everywhere. But historically, ecumenical, like the early ecumenical councils of the church before the split between Protestants and, and, and Catholics, um, it would have meant everybody <coughs> has representation. Okay? So, yeah, Vatican II, the reason that John XXIII was just canonized, you know, John XXIII as well as John Paul II, is because John XXIII, who was expected to be a, a placeholder until, because he was quite old when he was elected Pope, he was expected to just be a placeholder until they, he died quickly and they found somebody else. Well, he gets into office and all of a sudden he starts saying, there are a lot of problems in this church and we need to change it. And so he called the Second Vatican Council and he changed the way the council was run. Historically, committees would come together and the, the council, the um, College of Cardinals would deliver to these, these committees who represented the church worldwide, they'd say, okay, Here's what you're voting on. And they would tell them what to say. And historically, they had accepted that. Well, under John the 23rd's leadership, these commissions, which came from all over the world, Catholic, Catholic representation, um, the cardinals were delivering these things to these committees, and they went to like a committee on worship, for instance. And um, they looked at it and said, no, that's not what we want to say. <laughs> cardinals, after wetting their pants, do they wear pants? <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, they said, well, that's why the Second Vatican Council, the worship commission of the Second Vatican Council decided that the worship did not have to be in Latin. It could be in local languages. That, um, you know, that they should try to have music that people could participate in, sing along, kind of stuff. And all kinds of other changes from that one group that was part of the Second Vatican Council. 
It was the Second Vatican Council that changed the official, official doctrine, although they've waffled on this one uh, since then, that you, the Second Vatican Council said that Protestants were separated brethren. No longer was it an official doctrine that somebody who was not a Catholic, but was still a professing believer in Jesus, like us, no longer after Second Vatican Council it was the official doctrine of the church that we're damned to hell forever unless we become good Catholics, we don't stand a chance. The, the changes in Second Vatican Council were huge. Did I talk about this last week? <clears throat> Sometime recently, I, I, we got into it a little bit. Uh, I mentioned about the nuns that I met. The nuns whose, their name in Latin uh, is the Sisters of the Vacant Chair. Because what happened is so many people opposed the rulings of the Second Vatican Council and probably are very upset that John the 23rd was just made a saint. These, this particular order of nuns are the order of the vacant chair because the vacant chair represents the Pope and they believe that John the 23rd was not a legitimate Pope or he wouldn't have done what he did and that there have been no legitimate Pope since then. This is a big deal to the Catholic Church. Why is it such a big deal? Because they believe that the magisterium and the visible structure of the Catholic Church is what the true Church is more so than those who share in the faith. If you don't participate in the visible, and you understand what I mean by visible there, you know, the things you can see, not just to have faith and therefore share in the communion of faith with people around the world, which is the in invisible church, which is much more our focus, but rather that it has to be the structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? So, I want to give you a little, based on that, um, actually, I'm going to go back to this slide so you've got that in front of you. I want to talk a little bit about the history of how the doctrine of the church developed so that you can understand how some of this happened. And in fact, I want to say there are reasons why the Roman Catholic Church developed the doctrine that it has. I mean, we hear this and we go, oh, come on. What's wrong with you, right? That you believe. Well, there are reasons why the Catholic Church got there. And we need to understand those. So I'm going to give you a little history here. First, if we go back to... Um, the patristic period. Patristic period are the early church fathers, the ones immediately after um, the apostles. In the early church uh, period, the patristic period, for the most part, the emphasis was on the invisible church, that we all who profess Christ are together. And you can sort of read that in the New Testament. There's a sense in which Paul and some of the other writers will talk about all the different people who are part of the church in faith, whether, you know, a lot of different places. There was not a pope. There wasn't a central head over the church. The apostles, as a group, while they were still alive, were seen as the leaders and, and sort of uh, the, the ones who Jesus had ordained and anointed to be the ones to provide leadership. But there was not, there was not the kind of hierarchy that we experience later on and that exists today. Okay? So there was very much more a sense in which it was the communio fidelum, the community of faith, as being the focus of that. But fairly early on, in late first century, a lot in the second century into the third century, what started happening is all of these heresies started popping up. Uh, Nestorianism, Montanism, etc. Well, when these heresies started popping up, the church was challenged with how do we differentiate between the people who have a true faith and these other people whose faith is not according to Scripture, who we today would, would read what they said they believed, and we'd say, no, that's not Christianity. That's not the faith. Well, the Catholic Church was all that existed then. Remember, we weren't around yet. And so the Catholic Church had the challenge of how do we begin to define what's right and what's not in terms of our faith? How do we deal with all of these heresies? So the early church fathers, in order to be able to deal with that, they started focusing on the episcopal structure, or the bishops, as the leaders of the church. That, and, and they started needing to have some way they could hold those bishops accountable. That, okay, you're in charge of this church or the churches in this area, we need to make sure that you're not teaching false doctrine. This is why apostolic succession became so important. Apostolic succession, of course, is that if an apostle, Paul or Peter or John or one of them, if they ordained someone as a minister, they were pretty sure that person 
had the right doctrine because they've been taught by one of the people that have been taught by Jesus, right? Well, as you get further down the road, second century, because the last apostle, John, died at the end of the first century, second century, third century, the best they could come up with, and, and I mean that sincerely, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they could have done something better, I don't know of a better idea at this point. Their idea was, okay, if an apostle ordained someone and taught them, and then that person ordained someone and taught them, and that person taught and ordained someone, that's the best shot we have at making sure the teachings are consistent with what Jesus said and what the apostles were taught. Make sense? That's why apostolic succession became so important. It was in response to heresies that were coming out. And the church has sensed that that's the best, the best way we can try to make sure that their doctrine is correct and that their Christianity is real Christianity is if we can see a line between what Jesus taught the apostles and then what the apostles taught and ordained. Okay? And so they started emphasizing apostolic succession and they started focusing on making sure that the bishops and, and the pastors and others, but the bishops especially, that they had some way of making sure that they were staying on top of things theologically, that they were accurate in what they were saying. And over a period of time, that got more and more formalized and more and more entrenched to the point where they began to say, if you're not part of that official structure, if you're not part of the apostolic succession, if you're not one of the bishops or, or pastors that has been paying attention and is part of the, you know, is part of the correct theological crew, then you may be a problem. And so they started being very much more uh, forceful in making sure everybody was consistent with that. You see where that's going? And you see why they were motivated by that. Well, that became much more of a focus on the visible church the hierarchy, structures, activities, even the architectural, you know, eventually, that came later, where they're worshiping. Because if you just said the invisible church, then was Marcion, who said the God of the Old Testament was not the same as the God of the New Testament, and rejected everything except the letters of Paul and a heavily edited version of the Gospel of Luke, was, you know, he said he was part of the faith, was he? He claimed to be part of the invisible church, and all these other heretics that came along whose theology was completely wrong. The church was trying to get a grip on that. And that led us to these kind of problems. The man who was mostly responsible for articulating the, the early uh, doctrine of the church and formulating all of this kind of stuff is a man named Cyprian of Carthage. Cyprian of Carthage was born around 200, we believe. Um, Carthage, of course, being in North Africa. You do remember that North Africa used to be one of the major centers for Christianity. That's where, in fact, the two people who were responsible for developing the doctrine of the church and a lot of this stuff were Cyprian of Carthage and Augustine of Hippo. Carthage and Hippo, both being cities in North Africa. So Cyprian comes along first, and he's the one that really began to define bishops as being um, successors in a line from the apostles and having some means of discipline and you know, church discipline and control of that. He's the one who proposed that all of the bishops form a college. A college simply means a gathering, okay? Um, and that together they be responsible for making sure that each other are teaching the right, uh, the right doctrine. And if anybody else is being considered for appointment or ordination to become a bishop, they needed to make sure they were all right. Well, you begin to see that was very well intended and it's not a bad idea but it began to be much more entrenched as a control thing and much more a focus on the visible church than on the invisible church of faith. Then Augustine comes along. Augustine whose fingers are on virtually everything in the Christian faith. Augustine who is one of the great heroes of the reformers. Okay. Um, Augustine agreed with some of Cyprian's theological ideas, although Augustine also conceived the church significantly as the company of the elect, meaning back to that idea the communio uh, fidelit, to fidelium, or, as he used the words, the communio sanctorum, which means the holy communion. That is the, the, the gathering of, when I say communion, I don't mean holy communion like Eucharist, I mean the, the community, the holy community. Now, so he focused a lot, uh, Augustine was balanced. He saw the need to have a visible church that could control the doctrine and keep heresies from flaring up, but he also believed in the invisible church. 
that all those who profess faith uh, are part of that. Now, Cyprian and Augustine, what they wrote, what they taught, carried on down through, you know, through the ages. Um, as that became more and more entrenched, especially Cyprian's ideas, for instance, the visible church, the hierarchy, or to use the Catholic word, the magisterium of the church, became more and more elevated in their own eyes. They became more and more the ones who, got, who they believed God had made responsible for the true church, the true faith. And eventually they became themselves the true church and the true faith. And everybody else got to, you know, got to climb in the back of the truck and ride along. Eventually, that sense in which they were the ones responsible for the church means they began to see themselves and the Roman Catholic Church, it wasn't called that yet, but the Catholic Church, as being the very kingdom of God on earth. You will remember from other classes, the kingdom of God literally means the reign of God. And so they saw the Catholic Church the body of Christ as being eventually the very kingdom of God represented, the physical manifestation in the visible church of the kingdom of God on earth. Well, once they started thinking that way, that the magisterium represented the kingdom of God on earth, all sorts of things started happening. For one thing, it led them to the belief that all aspects of human life should come under the control of the church. If we're the very kingdom of God on earth, then we should be in charge of everything. And that's one of the things that led to the conflicts politically in the Middle Ages, where the Pope and the, and the local rulers, the kings, the emperors, whoever, were constantly struggling who was in charge. While the church, since they thought they were the kingdom of God itself, assumed that they were responsible for government, for schools, for science and art, for commerce and industry, for how the home is conducted, and everything else. <coughs> Bless you. So you can see how the doctrine of the church developed into something that was very controlling. It also, this idea of the kingdom of God, also in, uh, involved the idea that all of the blessings of God, including salvation, bless you, only came through the church. If the church is the very kingdom of God on earth, then all blessings, including salvation, have to come through the church. Nobody can directly access this stuff. It went further that um, as the church really got into this political thing, it led to all sorts of problems eventually where power became the focus. And the church became more and more secularized. Again, for theological reasons, they thought they needed to be more involved in the things of the world. Politics and social controls and arts and everything else. But the more they did that, the more secularized they became. And you ran into all sorts of problems where there was very little spiritual content in the popes or the Catholic Church. Popes who had multiple children and gave them high positions in the church. Even though they were married. Okay? I mean, popes were married. And that sort of secularization that decline in the spiritual focus of the church led to all sorts of things, including, ding, 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 the Protestant Reformation. If the Catholic Church had been paying attention to spiritual matters and not been secularized and so oriented toward trying to be in control of everything, then Martin Luther would not have had 95 problems with them. He would not have nailed the 95 theses, and the theses are in the form of, of questions, pretty pointed questions, like, how in the world can you justify blah, 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 whatever it was? like the selling of indulgences, etc. So that brings us to the Reformation. And in the Reformation, the idea of this infallible, hierarchical church that represented the very kingdom of God on earth and that um, was ruled by a special priesthood and ultimately by a pope. And remember, bishop is the highest, highest rank in the, in the Catholic Church. You have priests, you have monks who are a special case, you have priests and you have bishops. The Pope is only the Bishop of Rome. A Cardinal is just a bishop who's been given a special set of responsibilities over something and, and, and a funny hat. Um, but they're all the highest level you can go to is bishop. So the idea of these bishops and priests being in charge of everything and that only they could invite people and welcome people into the kingdom of God because only they could control the sacraments, that's part of the problem that Luther had and that the other reformers had after him. Luther comes along, and Luther was the first one who differentiated, at least in writing, between the invisible church and the visible church. 
Luther is the first one who said, yes, there is a visible structure in the church. And Luther was a monk and also a, you know, a teacher in the Catholic Church. But he said there's something more than that. He went back to a biblical model, he felt, which talked about that all people who believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with their mouth, confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, all of them share in the faith and therefore are connected with one another as the followers of Jesus, the invisible church. So Luther is the first one that identified that. Luther said there is both. It's not either or. There has been a tendency with the Catholic Church to say the visible church is really the only church. Because it's only through the visible church that anybody is a believer. And so the invisible church is just a non-secular. I mean, it, does, it doesn't fit in anywhere. It doesn't make sense. And then there are others who, in the Protestant Reformation especially, early on said the visible structure of the church has no meaning whatsoever. It's entirely the invisible connection of believers. Luther and Calvin after him, the two greatest most important leaders and theologians of the Reformation, both said there's both, and they're both important. The definition of the church is primarily the invisible church, but what you do in the visible structure is also important. It makes a difference, and you need to pay attention to that. Um, and so their emphasis was much more, yes, invisible connection, the invisible church, all believers in Jesus Christ, but you still have to have some reasonable way to manifest that in a way that affects people. The visible church. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so that visible and invisible differentiation is critical to our understanding. Today, we would say, as the Reformers said, that all believers in Jesus Christ are connected by our faith, no matter what language we have, no matter what color skin, no matter where we live, we are all part of the invisible church, which is the body of Jesus Christ on earth. Okay? However, different aspects of the Protestant church have made different decisions about what the visible church should look like. From uh, grand Anglican cathedrals, or even grand Presbyterian cathedrals, the, you know, the, 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 the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., or whatever else, you know, that, that uh, is Protestant. The various structures, and I'm going to talk about the different structures of authority here in a few minutes. Uh, the various activities how we administer the sacraments, what the sacraments are, we'll get into that next week. All of those are things that the church has had to decide, and they don't always agree on. We have very different ideas in the Presbyterian Church versus what the Baptists say, versus what the Anglicans say, versus etc. the Pentecostals would say. What's our primary responsibility? What is it we should be spending our time doing? How do we implement those things? There are wide varieties about how we do visible church. But we would all agree in the truth and importance of the invisible church. Okay? You good with that? No. No. What's wrong? We're dealing with Calvin and Luther men versus the actual church itself, which is the Son of God. Now, why would you put these two gentlemen and say, well, we've developed a new church? I could come along and develop a new church as well. However, the Son of God, the true Son of God, is the man that started the actual church in itself. Absolutely. So, it's very difficult to accept the teachings of an ordinary man in this new religion called Protestantism or whatever it might be. Right. Well, the, the one corrected to what you said, if what you said was true, I mean, if you were accurate in that, then I would agree with you. Well, what Luther and Calvin did was to seek to return to what the biblical model, they believed that God's instruction for what the church should be. So they were making this up. They didn't just come along and say, okay, I have a different idea about what the church should be. Luther comes along and later Calvin, Calvin's a generation later, and they say, what does scripture, the word of God, God's voice, what does it tell us that the church should be? Not what has been built up by the Catholic church over the last, in their case, 1500 years, well, what does the Word of God tell us? So, you know, don't misunderstand and think Luther and Calvin just made this stuff up. They have scriptural support for that. And you are absolutely right. In fact, um, I'll go here. The church in all its manifestations is part of the body which is called forth by Jesus. It is Christ who called forth, anointed, and ordained the church as his body on earth 
to continue his work until he returns. You're absolutely right. Luther and Calvin would absolutely agree with that. They were not trying to come up with something on their own or different. They were trying to return to what Scripture says. Is that fair? I believe so. Okay. Any other questions or comments about that? I mean, the reason that we, you know, that we um, affirm what Luther and Calvin said, and they didn't agree on everything. Sometimes you have to pick. But for the most part, they did agree because we believe, and we believe this was the nature of the Protestant Reformation. I say we, speaking for Protestants, as some of you may disagree with this, is that it was an effort to return to a more accurate understanding and representation of the faith based upon what Scripture says. I mean, that's why, you know, uh, the Luther's 95 Theses, all of them basically were, well, whether he actually says this or not, the focus of them is, Catholic Church, you're doing this, but Scripture says that. How do you connect, how do you relate those two? That, I don't see how those things fit together. That was, that was how the Reformation started. And in fact, the Reformation, of course, the, the, the great solas, or the declaration of the Reformation, first, sola scriptura, that Scripture alone is our source for authority. Not the Pope, not the priests, not the magisterium of the church, that Scripture is the source of our authority. And that we are saved by sola fide, faith alone, through sola gratia, grace alone, to the uh, sola gloria, the glory of God alone. Okay, so the focus very much was returning to, to the truth of Scripture, to the glory of God, what we find in, in His Word. Okay? Yes? It seems to me, and I, I might be off on this because I don't know it as well as, as you and many others, it seems to be that throughout the whole history of man's relationship with God, the thing that has divided man has been the leadership, right from the Pharisees to the Judaist view to the Catholic view. And so whether it was Calvin or Luther that had kind of stood back and said, no, I don't want to be a leader. The people themselves have to have the relationship with God. Yeah, the priesthood right? of all believers the is The power of the leadership is what has actually been the dividing factor. Yeah. All the way through. Well, that's true, except... Um, it's not like you can say we're not going to have leaders. Somebody has to be in charge, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the extent to which they exercise authority and they decide what they want and then make the people do it, I mean, there's a difference there. Um, actually, what you're saying is one of the things that has created the different, um, the different polities, that is, the way the church does, and, and the different authority structures. Yeah. The, very the structure clear, of the leadership. Exactly. You know, from the extreme being that there is a bishop, the pope, who is in charge of everybody, and then there are, there are bishops under that, to um, the Quaker meetings. The Quaker meetings were very much that. You get together, no one, no one is actually in charge. People speak as they feel led by the Holy Spirit. You know, there is no planned program for the most part in terms of people, you know, it is what the Holy Spirit inspires people to do. You know, those are the two extremes in terms of structure. Um, but the fact is that at some point, even in the Quaker movement, there have been people like George Fox and others who realized that at some point we need to have a clear clarification of theology or we need to have some sort of leadership that will take us. And, and God, we believe God brings up leaders. God anoints leaders. I mean, there's a scriptural model for that, even a mandate for it. But it is a struggle. You know, ideally the leaders will be humble, They'll be servants of God. They will not be, you know, in it for the power or the authority or the money or whatever it is. And yet, we are all fallen creatures. Yes. It, it makes me think about when Jesus was talking, when he was teaching, and he 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 starts talking to the Pharisees, and he says, "You brood of vipers, you stand in the door." And it makes me think of of sometimes when when. There's so much focus on who is in charge of everything. They make it so hard for people to understand how to have a free relationship with Christ. And they stand in the way. They stand in the door. Right. And Jesus spoke against that. Yeah, well, the Catholic Church would say a free relationship with Christ is not available. It has to be done through the hierarchy of the church. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, and again, we talk about authority. The reason why the Pope is held by the Catholic Church as being the, um, you know, the representative of Jesus of Jesus on Earth, is because of the passage in Matthew 16, where, of course, Matthew showed. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Peter and the other apostles had been out ministering, healing, teaching, 
they come back and they're jazzed. And as they're reporting in on what's going on, Jesus says, well, who is everybody saying that I am? Some say that you're Elijah, some say one of the other prophets, etc. And Jesus then looks at them and says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ meaning the anointed one. Okay. Um, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it is not from an earthly source that you got this understanding, but it is from God itself. You are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, which um, is why Peter is always shown with keys. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on, on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the Catholic Church reads that, and they say Peter is the foundation for the whole church. They believe he was the first bishop of Rome. Every, bish every pope since then is seen as an heir to the commission that was given to, to Peter. All right? By the way, there's no historical, strong, uh, there's no absolute historical evidence Peter was ever in Rome. Okay, it's tradition. Um, but that's where that comes from. And the idea that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, they see that the church has spiritual authority to forgive sins, to hold people in condemnation. Excommunication. Most of it's based upon that passage in Matthew 16. So they would say, we have authority for that from Scripture. But then they also believe, in terms of the details like the infallibility of the Pope, which came only in very late, you know, that's a very modern idea, um, those are all a product of the magisterium because they believe because Peter was especially anointed and ordained as the, as the first bishop, uh, the first Pope, and it's been passed down from him, the authority and responsibility has been passed down from him, then all of the members of the magisterium together, especially the popes, have a right to, as God inspires them, create doctrine that will lead the church. So things like the, you know, the, um, the sinlessness of Mary, Mary was born without sin, the Immaculate Conception, the bodily assumption of Mary, the infallibility of the Pope, uh, the existence of purgatory, uh, most, those are the kind of things that the magisterium, the leaders of the church, have come up with over the centuries because they believe God has given them not only that right, but that responsibility to develop doctrine. In addition to, equal to, in addition to the Bible. And much of that has to do with how they've interpreted the church and the role and responsibilities of the church. And I'm presenting this as neutrally as I can. I mean, clearly, I'm being clear what I believe, what Protestant believe, especially Protestant theologians. But uh, I'm not trying. I'm not saying any of this to try to make the Catholic Church look bad. You know, that's why I quoted from Catholic documents here in the definition of the church. Um, okay, let's take a break. Two o'clock. Let's take. A break. Now we are. Okay. Uh, let me go back and refer to something. Suzanne was going to ask a question just when I said, "Okay, take a break," uh, and I, I want to refer back to it because it's, uh, it's something I should have thought to say anyway. I quoted the passage from Matthew 16 where Jesus says, You are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Remember, Peter was not his original name. His name was Simon, son of, you know, uh, son of Jonah. Jesus gave him the name Peter, which is Petros. The word Petra means rock. You know the city of Petra? Which, by the way, the tour that I'm going to be speaking on is going to be going to Petra. So, um, and so Petra is rock. Petros... The masculine form of that is actually a diminutive, which means quite literally Jesus nicknamed Simon Rocky. That is what the word means. Okay, so his name, his nickname was Rocky. When he said, you are Peter the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, there is a lot of different interpretations. The Catholic Church, of course, interprets that as being, you are the authority, and all authority will then be passed down from you to your successors. And that's where the idea of the Bishop of Rome uh, being the Pope and the leader of the, of the entire church came from. Now, there are Protestant interpretations of that that are different. Some of them I don't think play. One of them, for instance, is that uh, some scholars will say, well, Jesus was talking to Peter, but then when he said, um, you are Peter the rock, and then he turned to all the, all the apostles and said, and on this rock, I will build my church, meaning all the apostles. I don't think so. I think he was talking to Peter. So the question is, 
what does it mean when Jesus said, on this rock, Peter, I will build my church? The Catholic Church interprets that as he would be the source of authority, and from him would be passed down the authority for the church. My interpretation, not just mine, others believe this too, is that Peter was the foundation of the church because in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled the, the followers of Jesus, Peter preaches, and 3,000 people came to saving faith in Jesus. In the days ahead, Peter preaches again, and 2,000 more. So in the first short period of time from the day of Pentecost, Peter preached so that 5,000 people came to follow, <laughs> came to believe in Jesus as the, as the Lord and Savior. That is, as far as we can tell, that's more people than had followed Jesus during his entire years of three, uh, three years of earthly ministry. I believe that's what Jesus meant when he said, on this rock, I will build my church. In other words, the first church, the church in Jerusalem, which was Jewish Christians, was created because Jesus prophesied it and the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to preach and for people to accept that message. I don't think you are Peter the Rock and on this rock I will build my church had anything to do with the past 2,000 years of hierarchy and <coughs> leadership over the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I think it had to do with what happened in the book of Acts. And Peter is the primary focus, and he was the primary leader early on amongst the apostles. Even Paul, I mentioned this to Suzanne, even Paul says, when I first, you know, when Jesus appeared to me and I first went down to Jerusalem, I met with Peter and James, and I don't remember if I met with any of the other apostles, I think is what he says at that point. He mentions this a couple times. So Peter clearly was seen as one of the primary people. He later mentions Peter, James, and John as being pillars of the church. Peter is always listed first whenever the apostles are listed. His name always comes first. So he clearly was significant in terms of leadership of the early church, but Peter's leadership, um, halfway through the book of Acts, Peter leaves Jerusalem during the time of persecution, and we hear almost nothing about him after that. You know, there are stories of, you know, the, the epistles of Peter were written. We have uh, stories of him traveling and other things that he did. There's a couple of references to him, but not a lot. The second half of the book of Acts is all about Paul. And so there clearly is a sense in which Peter, the, the apostle to the Jews, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, you can see that halfway through that book, there is a transition away from just the Jewish church and Peter's leadership to the wider scope of the Gentile church as well and Paul's leadership. So that's how I think we as Protestants need to understand that Peter is the rock on whom the church would be built. His preaching created the church in the book of Acts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. I think that's how we interpret that, not the way the Catholic Church interprets it. Okay? We good? Any other questions about that or anything related to it or anything we've said so far? Okay, um, I want to talk for a few, just a couple minutes about the difference in the universal church and the local church. I probably should put a small c on that local church because I differentiated that earlier. Um, we do believe, and I threw this up here because of the question as to, you know, where does the church come from? The church in all its manifestations, the invisible church, the visible church in terms of as that's rightly understood, um, and both the local church and the global church, all of them, if they truly are believers and followers in Jesus Christ, if they are the true church, then all of them are part of Jesus' calling them forth and anointing them. In, in his book, in the book, Grudem's does a pretty good job, I believe, of talking about true church and false church. And how do you, you know, what's the difference? How far, how far off Orthodox theology does the church have to go in order to no longer be the true church? The ultimate point there is, what do they say about Jesus? This is always the question. If you wonder whether a particular church or a particular religious group or a particular philosophy or an individual, and it's not for us to judge individuals, but we do have to have some ability to make discrete judgments about, uh, you know, not, not negative judgments, but uh, still discrete judgments about, are Jehovah's Witnesses correct? Is the Mormon Church right? Um, you know, was Jim Jones accurate in his view? Was David Koresh uh, rightly interpreting Scripture? We do have to make some of those kind of judgments, or else we're lost. 
There are a whole lot of heretics out there. There's a whole lot of false teachers. In our, in our class in uh, the pastoral epistles, we just looked at 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude yesterday. All four of those books, plus a lot of other books in the New Testament, Paul and others, have to do with how to identify false teachers. So identifying false teachers and false doctrine is part of what we're responsible to do. It's not for me to say, Art, you're going to hell. That's not my job. And, and you're not, I don't think. <laughs> um, but if Art is telling me something and saying, oh, you need to understand that Jesus was only one of the saviors that you can believe in and be saved, I need to be able to say, I don't think so. I think you're going off track there. That is not the scriptural doctrine. And so I have to be able to make discrete judgments. Gruden does a pretty good job of saying, how far are we prepared to go? And he's actually pretty compassionate about it. That Some people, it's like they wonder, they're Christians who wander through life trying to figure out what's wrong with everybody else. I think Bob Hughes said to me, you knew somebody who is always saying, I don't think that person's saved. That's not something you should ever say. That's not our job. We have not been given that ability. But I do have the responsibility, if that person is saying something or teaching something, to say, I don't believe that's scriptural. I don't believe that that's correct. I don't believe that that's biblical. Okay. So we do have some responsibilities in that regard. Um, but always, the primary point, there's a lot of latitude. The, the point at which there is no latitude is what do they say about Jesus? If they say he was not the Son of God, if they say he wasn't really resurrected from the dead, if they say he's just one more leader, uh, amongst many you could pick, if they say he was just a great teacher and a great guy, if we all listen to him, the world would be a better place, but he wasn't God. They've fallen off the edge. We can't accept that. What do they say about Jesus is the fundamental thing. Because within the church, we believe that the church is the body called forth by Jesus. It all goes back to him. Apart from that, do you sprinkle or dunk? <laughs> do you use wine or grape juice? You know, do you serve communion to people as they sit in the pews, or do you make them come up front? Do you know that stuff is all negotiable as far as I'm concerned. Now not everybody agrees with that. A hardcore Dynamo Baptist would say, if you don't get them all the way under the water, they're not really saved. Whereas we would say, we'll talk about this next week, baptism itself has nothing to do with being saved. Being baptized does not save you. There are Protestants who would start throwing stones at me right now, having said that. Okay? So, but there's a lot of things like that that we can differ on and still have fellowship if we agree with the idea that it is all from Christ. Now, we believe that the universal church, which is another way of saying the invisible church, all those who, as Paul says in Romans, confess their, with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, we can have fellowship together as a universal church. But it's also important for us to recognize that the church needs to have a local represent a local manifestation. It is not enough for me just to say, boy, I look forward to Sunday mornings because I'm going to put my feet up and read the paper and have a cup of coffee and watch a black and white movie and every Sunday morning is going to be like that for me. Whoa, aren't you a Christian? Yeah, well, don't you go to church? No. Like I said about my friend, you know, I don't have anything else to do with the church. That's wrong. In fact, that's a sin. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. The Bible says, the New Testament says, we have an obligation to support, to encourage, to give our gifts in support of the local church. Just believing in the universal and invisible church is not enough. We need to be part of the local church and do everything we can to support it. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're going to talk about next week. Um, Paul writes that every believer, every Christian is given gifts by the Holy Spirit why? For the sake of the common good. If we don't gather together as a local church, how are the gifts that God has given me through the Spirit going to be available for the common good of everybody else? You need to be in church. Okay? <coughs> the local church. Then we get to the purpose of the church. Um, why does the church even have to exist? When we get saved, why doesn't, doesn't Jesus just vacuum suck us up into heaven and we move on? Okay, why the church? Well, the first reason is the one that people often 
either don't get or don't like, and that is that we are at the church to share the good news, making disciples for Jesus, which is the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Most people, whether they would say this or not, and, and Carolyn actually read a book that said this, um, would say that the primary responsibility of the church, or the thing the church exists for, is to encourage and edify and nurture believers. Well, that's one part of it, but that's not the main reason. The main reason, which Jesus himself told us, which is why we believe it's the main reason, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, starting with verse 16 here. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because he has all authority, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The reason why I list the Great Commission, the, the requirement that we have to share the good news, to evangelize, to tell people about Jesus, is because that's one of the very last things he told us to do. Clearly it was very important. We have an obligation based upon what Jesus told us as the church. It's one of the reasons we're left behind is so we can be here to tell more people. We are to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Okay. So we have that as a responsibility. Secondly, and, and you could say this is the first reason, because the second one actually comes into it, but I wanted to focus on the Great Commission, because a lot of people have trouble with this idea of evangelism. When I started this pastor at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, we had 20 or 25 people there, and I started talking about we need to be we need to be growing. You know, we need, and I had somebody come up to me and go, no, 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 we like it like this. We want a small little church where we know everybody and you know it's warm and comfortable. We don't want to grow. And I said, you know what? If you don't want to grow, then I'm not your guy. And I don't want to grow just so that we can be a big church or we can boast about being a church. I want to grow because every person that's there is a soul that God wants to speak to, either to bring them to a saving knowledge of His Son, Jesus, or to encourage them in that knowledge so they can be more effective in their witness and, and ministry in the world. Bob? I just think it's interesting. <clears throat> Choose the churches that they go to. You know, it doesn't seem like they're choosing them because they're mm -hmm. a Bible church or a missionary church. Right. Or whatever. It's because they they got a good cheerleading squad or a good <laughs> softball team. It's a church near my house. Or it's a beautiful church. Or it's a small church. Or it's a big church. But they have a pipe organ, and I really like pipe organ. Or exactly. Whatever. It doesn't seem like they're making them on the basis of doctrinal beliefs. It's just that these external things. I think that's true. And we, in our, it's amazing to me how often our Bible study classes and the things we talk about in here cross over. Bible study this morning, we were talking about the fact that so many people, their Christian faith is based upon what's comfortable and what's entertaining. You know, and, and it's, it, if it wasn't comfortable, if I didn't, you know, if I didn't enjoy it, I'm not going to go. And the challenge we put forward this morning is that if we serve the God of the whole universe, recognizing that the majority of Christians in the world today are suffering persecution, okay? The Christian church in the 21st century is the most persecuted body in the history of the world. Don't let anybody tell you any different. How would we respond? How would I, I talk about when I say we, I mean, each of us need to ask that question. How would I respond if I really did suffer persecution? If somebody kicks in the door because I'm having a Bible study and arrests everybody and takes the Bibles away from us and burns them, I think we each need to ask ourselves a question. How serious am I about this? How far am I prepared to go in order to maintain my faith and belief in Jesus Christ? Or the first minute that it starts looking like it's going to be difficult, do we all you know, hit the road? I'm out of here. Or... I don't like the music they're singing there now. I'm out of here. Or, those chairs are really uncomfortable. I'm going to find another church. Or whatever else it is. How serious are we about worshiping the Lord our God? Now, 
Our church has grown. I hope it's because the minister who has his problems is really trying to preach from Scripture. I know that our, our Spanish pastor is, our Spanish language pastor, okay? Um, I hope that's the case. And we have never, in case anybody ever asked you, we have, I have never, to my knowledge, ever invited anybody who's attending another church to come here instead. But as I've always said, we don't steal sheep, but if a sheep ever shows up at our door and say, I'm starving to death in the pasture I'm in, can I come in there? We're not going to turn them away. And so, you know, some people have come from other churches to our church. But the point is, if they're going to get offended by hearing the gospel, then they're going to get offended. Because that's what we're going to do. How do I get into that? Anyway. Well, also, well, worship is saying in faith, the saying is, what is my part? Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's um, hugging people on Sunday or greeting people or asking how they are or asking if they need anything, you know, you know what is my part? Right. Exactly. You know, what, what, and that has to do with the gifts. You know, what gifts has God given me by His Holy Spirit that I need to be sharing with the congregation? Um, hospitality is one of the gifts. So welcoming people, making them feel welcome and comfortable is a gift of the Holy Spirit, very clearly. Um, you know, th there are a lot of them. The gift of, of helps, the people who take out the garbage and wash the dishes, that is a spiritual gift to be able to do so with joy and not feel put upon by it. Um, and you know what? It's just as important as preaching. And I honestly believe that. Okay? I know people don't attend a church because they've got a really good dishwasher. But I do believe that in the ultimate picture of things, in, in what brings glory to God, that's just as important. Okay? All right. So when you talk about bringing glory to God, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, do everything to the glory of God. So everything we're supposed to be as Christians, which means as the church. Again, as the invisible church is the definition is all of us Christians linked together in faith. Worship, you know, this brings glory to God when we gather as a church and worship. A church that doesn't gather for worship is not a church. It's a club. And that's why to be a Christian and say, I don't attend worship anywhere, there's something wrong with that. There's something broken somewhere. That doesn't mean that you're condemned if you don't show up, you know, three times a week. But there should be a sense in which you gather with other believers, because we're told to, for the purpose of worshiping God. And that does include, which we'll talk about next week, it's the practice of the sacraments. That is communion, or Eucharist, as it's called, and baptism. Okay? Uh, the Catholic Church, of course, has seven sacraments. They, you know, they include other things, including matrimony. Marriage is a sacrament. Um, extreme unction, which is last rites, is a sacrament. Uh, the holy orders, which means to be ordained as a priest or a monk, is uh, a sacrament. Well, the difficulty we have is that the Protestants, we believe, and, and the, the Protestant reformers decided, a sacrament needs to be something that Jesus himself did and something that he ordained for us to do. <clears throat> Jesus did not get married. He was not ordained in any official way. To say you know, he's the son of God, of course he was ordained by God the Father, but not in any way that we would recognize as an ordination. Um, he didn't have anybody do last rites at his death, and so the Protestant church accepts only two rather than seven sacraments. Baptism, which Jesus himself was baptized, and he said to John the Baptist, when John the Baptist said, no, 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 you should be baptizing me, Jesus said, no, we do this now so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. In other words, he was... We believe that means he was doing it as an example for us, that we should do it too. Um, and then Jesus, at the, at the Last Supper, he told us, practice this in remembrance of me. As often as you shall do this, do it in remembrance of me. Okay. So, worship, which includes the sacraments. Instruction, we need to be teaching. A church that doesn't teach is not really a church. Now, that teaching can come through uh, sermons, it can come through Bible studies, it can come through classes. All of the studies, including a study that was that uh, Willow Creek in Illinois commissioned uh, a few years ago, which, which uh, surveyed 250,000 Christians, 
to identify what are the things that most advance them in their Christian faith. What is it that makes them more Christian, if you will? In other words, that they feel leads them to greater maturity in their Christian faith. Unequivocally, it wasn't prayer, it wasn't participating in worship services, it was studying the Word of God. Knowledge of the Word of God is the thing that has more influence on our growth than anything else. Well, somebody needs to be teaching that. And that's one of the reasons this institute exists. It's because I believe, with everything I have, that teaching this stuff so that people can learn it is one of the most important things that we can do. So, and then fellowship. We have, in our church, we have, um, we call them service groups. And each of the service groups, which is led by a deacon, has areas of responsibility. One of those groups, for instance, is, under fellowship, is the community life and events. They're the party planners. <laughs> it's more than that, but that's what it boils down to. They're responsible for the refreshments after services, for the games nights, for the you know our potlucks, any of those kinds of activities. And why? Because fellowship, getting together. If we come and we sit for an hour and listen to a sermon and then scuttle off and don't do anything else in terms of the church, how are we part of a body? The church is the body of Christ, which means we need to have more interaction with each other than just sitting there silently in the midst of a whole bunch of other people for an hour on Sunday morning. It's more than that. So instruction. And then service. We are called to meet the needs of others. Jesus is our model. Jesus not only preached, but he healed and he drove out demons. He fed those who were hungry. We need to be doing the same stuff. We'll just wait till you see what's going to happen when we get our new church and we have the facilities for more of that. Okay, so those are some of the purposes for the church. And in a very real way, if we're not doing all of those things, then we're not really a church. We may be a club, we may be a social function, we may be any number of other things you could call it, but the church has to do all of those things or they're not the church. And we could come up with some others as well. Prayer, for instance which we assume is part of, you know, is part of worship. But um, there are things, other things, you know. Art said to me um, at men's breakfast the other day that one of the things that you all like is the fact that we have a prayer of confession every worship service, every Sunday. We together will confess our sins. And then I will declare that as you have confessed your sins and repented of them by the grace of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. That's part of what we need to do as a church. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, I want to talk for a minute too about structure and authority in the church. How is the church um, put together in terms of the people in charge? There are three primary models. Uh, I mean, I say primary models. There are some others um, that, that might be floating around the periphery, but these almost all churches are one of these three. Historically, churches have tended to be either Episcopal, Presbyterian, or Congregational in their structure. Let me explain that. Episcopal comes from the word episkopos, which means bishop. The Episcopal churches are those that have bishops as their primary authority figure. And underneath that bishop will be pastors or priests or whatever. The Catholic Church, obviously, is an Episcopal church. They have bishops, some of whom get funny hats and are called cardinals, but they're still just bishops. The Anglican Church is an Episcopal model. They have bishops. The Methodist Church is an Episcopal model. They have bishops. The African Methodist Episcopal Church has bishops, and there are a few others. But if they have a model where they have a bishop, Episcopus, then they are part of an Episcopal structure. Now, um, I'm going to come back. Well, I'll do it right now. Um, where did bishops come from? In the early days of the church, there were pastors <coughs> and elders. We're going to talk about elders in a second when we get to Presbyterians. Well, those, the, the pastors over a local church, and then those, those pastors were elders. They were called elders. Presbyteros. There's also um, the, the word overseer occurs in there. And what happened is, as the church grew, and you would have multiple churches in an area... They, they developed a sense in which, you know, we need somebody who's kind of coordinating the churches in this little area and who sort of we look to for guidance and authority, especially as certain people in the early church proved that they were especially gifted as preachers or teachers 
or as administrators. The gift of administration is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then the other churches, the ministers and the other and, and the congregation of the other churches would say, you know, Al, you really have a gift of administration. We really need to look to you because you can help us. So why don't you sort of become the first among equals? Why don't you become more than just an elder? You become the sort of senior elder. And they started to be called bishops. So a bishop was just sort of an elder who had responsibility probably in most cases early on for their own church, but also were looked to from other churches for kind of senior leadership and direction and to kind of organize everything, right? That's where the idea of a bishop came from. It was a natural kind of organic development. There wasn't anything artificial about it. We can't look at that model and go, oh, that's of the devil. No, the early church developed that because it made sense. You know, why do you have, think about any management structure you've ever been aware of, any kind of any structure, there'll be somebody who has multiple people reporting to them, and each of those person, people will have multiple people reporting to them. That's an efficient and appropriate, sensible way to organize things. That's where bishops came in, to organize other elders and pastors, right? The second model, stop me if you get any questions about this, the second model is Presbyterian. It doesn't just mean Presbyterian churches. This comes from the word presbuteros, which means elder. The presbuteros, or the elder model, is clearly in Scripture. You know, bishop, you can sort of interpret the word overseer as meaning bishop, but, you know, that, that's something that developed in the history of the church, but it's not so much the bishop idea. It's not so much tracked back to Scripture. But Scripture does talk about elders. It says, for instance, that Paul and, and various other, Silas and Paul and Barnabas, various people he worked with, that as they, as they planted churches or as they revisited churches, they would be responsible for appointing or, or anointing, it may be an ordination process, elders. And there's a model for multiple elders in churches, and that is biblical. So the idea of the Presbyterian model is that um, Whereas the Episcopal model, the bishop really has authority to do whatever he thinks is necessary. He or she, in the case of some, like Methodist Church, can have women, and Anglican Church can have female bishops, the Catholic Church can't. But they have authority to do pretty much whatever they want. The Methodist bishops, for instance, we don't think of Methodist, Protestants being that way. The Methodist bishop can say, I'm moving you to a new church, pack your bags. In fact, they used to do that for everybody once every three years. Can you imagine the cost of that? And so um, the Methodist bishops, Anglican bishops, Catholic bishops have the authority to just decide what needs to be done and tell, tell people we're going to do it. The Presbyterian model is a group of elders that are elected from within the congregation. And they are ordained. And once they're ordained as an elder, they're always an elder. And those elders together, and the pastor, by the way, in the Presbyterian model, is almost always sort of a, an elder with special portfolio. For instance, we have in our church lay elders. I am an elder of the word and sacrament. That's the title in the Presbyterian church for a pastor. I'm, I'm equal to the other elders in terms of ruling, but I have the special responsibility of preaching the word and of administering the sacraments. They're elected from within the body. Um, they're, um, they're approved in that regard. Now, in most Presbyterian models, those elders then participate at a higher level, called the presbytery. And then those presbyteries are connected to the main denominational headquarters. In the Presbyterian Church USA, that's in Louisville. For other reasons I've talked about before, I think we don't, we're not linked to that. We're our own entity. Technically, Lakeside Presbyterian Church is a, is a denomination. That's what the institutional thing means to the, to the government of Mexico. Not because we want to necessarily be independent, but the only... The only Presbyterian bodies that exist in Mexico that we could be linked to, we don't agree with doctrinal. And so that's why we're independent. Okay? But the Presbyterian model means there are leaders that are identified and elected from within. And they rule the body. I'm equal to all the other elders in terms of ruling elder. If they all get together and vote and say, we don't want you as our pastor anymore, they have the authority to do that. A bishop would have to be, the college of other bishops would have to decide, you know, you've done something too serious, you've got to go. And that almost never happens. The third model is congregational. These are Baptists, Congregationalists, as you might imagine, and some other Protestant denominations. The idea there is that the, the congregation will usually elect a lay board. 
And that lay board will work with, usually under, the pastor. Congregational churches, in the vast majority of cases in my experience, and not just mine, but you know, the congregational churches, while they'll have a lay board, you know, not that it's not ordained board, the pastor almost always has much more authority to, to act unilaterally in congregational churches. A Baptist minister is, you know, has, it's very seldom that a lay board will tell a Baptist minister, you know, do this, don't do that. The congregational model, usually the minister has a lot more authority. The lay, um, and there are a couple of different versions of that, but generally that's true. The congregational, unlike Episcopal or Presbyterian, which almost always link to some larger denominational kind of uh, connection, officially any congregational model is just that. The congregation is technically independent. Now they may voluntarily choose to affiliate, for instance, the Southern Baptist Convention. I was, you know, I used to be a Southern Baptist. The Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant body in the world. There are more Southern Baptists than any other, any other flavor of Protestants. I once had an argument with a guy, he said there were more Southern Baptists than there were Catholics. I went, no, but he had never, never known anything else. You know, like two out of every three people he'd ever met were, were Baptists. So the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant gathering in the world, or affiliation in the world, but a Baptist church does not have to belong to it. Technically, the authority is at the congregational level, and usually that means the minister. Okay, fair? Isn't there also congregational rule, or congregational rule is more credible there, too? Uh, well, it's true. I mean, the congregation will uh, usually will need to approve things. The congregation, you know, the lay members of the, the lay board, uh, sometimes they're called directors or various other things, they're elected from the congregation. And so, again, there's not somebody from outside who comes in and says, you have to do this or you have to do that. Um, but, you know, that model is it's focused on the congregation rather than on a board of elders or rather on, than on a bishop. Carolyn? In the congregational churches, don't the, isn't the um, hiring and firing of the pastor part of the board's responsibility? It's not, it's, no. you Usually made it's it. the congregation. Oh, okay. They actually will go to the congregation for it. So, but... You're saying that you think that the, the pastor has all the authority, but really they can fire him. I they mean, can. And, yeah, they, and they can hire anybody they want. I'm talking about the day-to-day. -day. I okay. mean, you know, think, gotcha. about, think about your dad's church. Yeah. Okay, where, you know, it's, it's yeah. clearly the authority is in the, in the hands of the pastor. And so it is the congregation that's responsible. I mean, if they need a new minister, they may, you know, they may elect a, a group of people from within that to make nominations, but the congregation is the one who makes the decision. And the congregation can vote a minister out. <laughs> I'm talking in the practical day-to-day, -day, in most cases in the congregational model, the ministers have more authority than a minister does in either the Presbyterian or, or a minister in the, in the Episcopal model. In the Presbyterian model, the elders are a balance against the authority of the pastor. In the Presbyterian model, uh, or I'm sorry, in the Episcopal model, the bishop is the one who mitigates the authority of the local minister, okay? Uh, but the, present, the congregational model has more variety than the other two. You know, there, there is a lot of differences in that. Again, from, from the Quaker model, where it truly is completely democratic and congregational, to some in which the pastor is actually would be drawn above the lay board, okay? And, and everything in between. Yes? Well, just one minor question. What, what, are, what are Lutherans class at? Uh, Lutherans, um, Lutherans are Episcopal. They have bishops in the Lutheran Church. Um, although, again, Lutheran bishops don't—they're not nearly as authoritative, in my experience. But they'll, they're, they, i think there's more authority given at the congregational level than most. But now, you know, that depends on what, what flavor of Lutheran you're talking about. You know, there's fairly li there's very liberal Lutherans, and then there's Lutheran Missouri Synod, which is quite fundamentalistic. I don't say that negatively. I mean, they're just very, very conservative in their interpretation of doctrine. And that varies widely. Presbyterian, the same thing. Um, that's why we're independent. It's because there's other kinds of Presbyterians, like the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico, that are, um, they don't allow women in any role of leadership, for instance. And we don't believe that. We don't accept that. And so that's why we're not affiliated. Okay. So those are the structures. And then authority is related to that. Obviously, the bishop has tremendous authority in the Episcopal model. Um, the elders maintain authority, and then within. And it's interesting, though, when you get to the denominational level, 
like in the Presbyterian Church USA, Peace USA, which we as we uh, we um, consider ourselves linked to them in terms of as our church in terms of polity and, and historic uh, views, although we're not technically linked. But I had somebody coming to me, and he just kept coming back at me about this that the Presbyterian Church, the PC USA, came out with this these materials, which were. Um, against the nation of Israel. You know, it was against Zionism, literally. Zionism being the, the idea that God has ordained a, a national you know, a national entity and that in the 1940s when Israel was, was reestablished that that was a fulfillment of that Zionistic expectation. Well, this material was all saying Zionism is evil. Zionism, well, the Presbyterian Church published this. Well, this guy kept coming at me saying, what's wrong with the Presbyterian, what's wrong with the Presbyterian Church? You know, it's awful, it's awful, what are we going to do about this? And I said, well, a couple things. We're not part of the Presbyterian Church USA. So that's not our church. There's nobody in the, in the, in the denomination PC USA who even knows that I'm a Presbyterian minister in Mexico. Okay. Secondly, the actual denominational side of the Presbyterian Church is so loosely connected every one of the different departments or commissions and they have all of sorts of different structural things are very independent they'll have their own budget and they do whatever they want and i'm absolutely sure that the general moderator of pcusa and a lot of the other people in leadership had no clue about this until it was published and distributed in the controversy arose because there's no real strong central authority why? Because it's not an Episcopal model. It's a Presbyterian model, and the elders are loose, you know, denominationally are more loose than that. Okay, here's your idea. A couple more things I want to talk about. Uh, first is the creation of the church. I mentioned this earlier. There's two different ways to think about this. One, that the church exists since the call of Abraham. That God, and now the, the call of Abraham was when the people of Israel really were created. They weren't called Israel yet, because Israel was Abraham's grandson, <laughs> Jacob. But the Hebrew people, who were the descendants of Abram, began with God's call of Abram, which is at the end of the 11th chapter of Genesis, the start of the 12th chapter of Genesis. At that point, God said, Abram, go where I send you, follow me, I will be your God, and you will become the father of a great people, I will give you a land to be your own, the promised land. That's why it's called that, because there was a promise made. And you will be the blessing to all the peoples of the earth. Now, from Abram, who became Abraham, his son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, who later was renamed Israel, the twelve sons of Israel, who became the twelve tribes of Israel, and the whole history of the Israelites, it was out of that that Jesus came. There's a reason Jesus was a Jew, because God's promise to the Israelites as his chosen people. Many people, and I'm one of them, would say that the church, the foundations of the church, began with the call of Abraham and the foundation in the beginning of the, of the Hebrew people. The other belief is that the church began on the day of Pentecost, when, as I talked about earlier, when Peter preached and 3,000 people came to a saving knowledge. The Christian church as we experience it did start on the day of Pentecost. I mean, yes, there were followers of Jesus before that, but the church in terms of a gathering of people who would gather for worship and for prayer and for service and all those other things we talked about, the others had been followers of Jesus, more learners. But in terms of an active body that is the body of Christ in the world, it began at the day of Pentecost. But it clearly is built on the foundation of everything that came before. Go back and read Peter's sermons, or read the testimony that Stephen gave right before he was stoned, or, or uh, Philip, or any of this other stuff in the book of Acts, and you clearly will see that when they're explaining who Jesus is and what's going on here, they go back all the way to Abraham. They go back to the promises of the Old Testament. The church is a fulfillment of the promises that go all the way back to Abraham, and were reiterated. With Isaac, God reestablished his covenant with Isaac. Abraham's son, including, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Jacob, God reaffirmed his commitment to Jacob and the covenant with Jacob, including saying, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Well, that blessing, which ultimately came through the sacrifice and atoning, atoning death of Jesus, 
is a fulfillment of that promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And in that way, I believe that it is a consistency. And if you read in the book, some theologians say, especially dispensationalists, would say that God has a whole different plan for the Jews. And that the Jew, some of them will say, the Jews are going to rule on earth, the Christians are going to live in heaven. I don't buy it. Uh, in fact, if you read Romans, Paul very plainly says that the, that the Jews will come in mass. I mean, he suggests that the Jewish people in mass will come, will return to God by accepting his son Jesus. I told you a lot about my working with Jews for Jesus, and that's one of the, one of the promises that they claim, and that it really gives them energy for their ministry, is that they're promised in Scripture, in Romans, that God will, will fulfill the, the promise to the Jews by bringing them to Jesus. And that's what they do, is they tell Jews about Jesus. So um, there's very much a sense in which the promise goes all the way back. I think that Scripture is plain that the Jews will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, and we are all part of that same covenant then, at that point. God had a first covenant with the Jews, a new covenant through Jesus, but anyone who accepts Jesus will be part of that new covenant. Okay? I'm not going to give it a lot more detail than that because there's not time for it. But you do have people who have differences about that. This is the story of Pentecost, when the church as we know it today was founded from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost, now Pentecost was a celebration of the giving of the law of Mount Sinai. It was a Jewish holiday. It's, Pentecost was not originally a Christian holiday like we think of it. It just happened that on that Jewish holiday, God sent the Holy Spirit, and so we celebrate it now. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And if you go the next section here, verse 6 and following, it lists all the different places they come from. From as far away as Rome, Alexandria, Libya, Persia. In fact, a good, uh, a good study Bible, like the NIV study Bible, will have a map. And there's arrows going everywhere. They were all there to celebrate this festival. And the reason why that's the time God chose to do this, I believe, is because after the day of Pentecost, all those who get converted, which I'm going to read right now, they all went home. And what did they do when they went home? They told other people about Jesus. This was one of the first sort of multiplying factors that God instituted to spread the faith in his son Jesus. But we go on, starting with verse 40 of chapter 2. Paul has preached his sermon. And it says, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Peter's sermon. 3,000 converts. On this rock I will build my church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, member instruction, member fellowship as requirements for the church, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, sacraments, prayer and worship. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Remember my part about, you know, you can't just come and sit for an hour quietly a week and then think you're part of the body? This is what the first church looked like. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's the start of the church as we know it today, although the seeds of that, I believe, go back to Abram. All right? Now, one other thing I want to talk about is the authority and destiny of the church. We don't often use these terms today, and it's a shame because they're very powerful. Um, the church militant and the church triumphant are two terms that have historically been used. You'll occasionally find them in an old hymn. The church militant means the church that is marching forward in the world today representing Jesus and preaching his name. It, it, they call it the church militant, not because we should have armies and weapons, but because the church opposes the devil and opposes all that is contrary to the gospel and to the saving will of Christ. 
So we are militant in that regard. We are soldiers of the Lord. Not that we should have you know, tanks and stuff, again, but that we should see our job as being to march forward opposing the forces of evil and the devil and, and atheism and agnosticism and everything else in representing the truth of Christ. The church triumphant is are all of those believers in Jesus Christ who have gone ahead, those who are, who are in the presence of Christ now, who will join with him when he returns. You know, and then we who are who have died and are in the graves will be caught up with them. Those who are still alive will also be caught up to join them in the air. And the church will be reunited with Christ as we prepare for the final judgment. Okay? Church militant, us moving forward. Church triumphant, you know, those who have gone before, who are now in the presence of Christ, who will be, we will be reunited with at that time. Now, the idea is that the Christians who have died are in the presence of the Lord now. Their bodies are in the grave. Those bodies will be perfected. Glorification, we talked about last week, at the last day. But they are already there. We will join them. Okay? Now, one last thing I want to talk about in the next few minutes. The four marks or attributes of the church. These are statements that we make in the Nicene Creed, for instance, about what the church, what constitutes the major focus, or the major yeah, attributes of the church. The church is one, holy, catholic, and apostolic. I mean, we could add sacramental, but we use these four because they are part of our creeds. One, it means the followers of Jesus Christ are one in their belief in one God and one Lord Jesus Christ. Holy, the followers of Jesus Christ are holy, not meaning that we're without sin, but rather that we are set apart for a special purpose by and for God. And as the Holy Spirit, or the sanctification we talked about last week, as the Holy Spirit works in us, we become more holy. That's what sanctification means. Oh, nope. I thought I turned that thing off, but I must have done it earlier. Okay. Um, so we are one in our belief in one God and one Lord. We are holy. We are Catholic. The followers of Jesus Christ are the church Catholic or universal, made up of all people everywhere and at all times who believe in and profess Jesus Christ. The difference in one and Catholic is one means we have one faith. We all believe the same thing, and that is in Jesus Christ. Okay. We have one faith, one belief, in one God, and one Lord. Catholic means we're everywhere. Okay? Um, we are, the church is universal. That is that universal, invisible church. And we are apostolic, meaning the church is based on the continuity of the teaching of the apostles of Jesus, especially as recorded and taught in Scripture. And this... That's, we believe that's true, and that's also the basis from which the Catholic Church then developed the idea of apostolic succession, that uh, the authority goes back to what the apostles taught, because Jesus chose them and ordained them and taught them to be the sources of what we know. Okay. Um, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Again, we could, cut, we could add sacramental, that we, you know, we, part of what we do as a church is we offer sacraments, but this is part of our creed. Um, questions about any of that? The nature of the church... Any of those things. What it is, how it works, who we are, where we're going is the triumphant part. You know, that's that's that we will be, we will join the saints who have gone before with Jesus in the air as we prepare for the final day. Okay, folks, next week we will talk about the doctrine of sacraments and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how those things fit together. Both of those really are linked to the church idea, but obviously didn't have time to get into that today. Thank you.